Yeah. Run it up, to run it back. Yeah. Run it up, to run it back. Run it up, to run it back. Yeah. Run it up, to run it back. Yeah. Yeah. Run it up, run it back. Run it up, run it back. Y'all, I'm not trying to jinx it, but that opening might be in trouble here in a few more hours. <laughs> It'd be one man standing. Uh, good morning and welcome to Run It Back here on FanDuel TV. Joined, as always, by Stadium Insider Sham Sharania, Chandler Parsons. Did you guys have a good, nice, long holiday weekend? Did you do I anything? Sure did. Had a buddy's birthday, had a little barbecue at the house. It was uh, it was good. Weather Weather's finally nice out here in L.A. I love this for you. Shams, what do you do? A little R and R, a little bit of basketball, a little bit of getting ready for the week. You know, a little bit of everything. I feel like uh, we're gonna have too much R and R here if this series ends tonight, and we all have to sit around and twiddle our thumbs for the next nine days. But we will get to that problem when we have to. But of course, we're gonna start with the Celtics taking care of business. It's crazy because I, I know this was a sweep, but man, there were times where it just didn't feel like that. Uh, they do move on, 105-102, the final on that one. Jalen Brown, the Eastern Conference MVP, 29 points. He was 11 to 22. Tatum had 26. Nemhard with 24 points and 10 assists. Um, Chandler, we're going to start with a little KG here because he said he thinks it's the Celtics' time. Does it feel like that to you? Yeah, I mean, I've been saying I feel like it's the Celtics' time <laughs> from pre from training camp this year. They just seem like the 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 way that they've got here, the heartbreak, the the winning at a high clip, but never kind of getting over that hump. And now they have their team. They have got their two star, stars going into their prime. They're healthy, minus KP, but they have so many other ways to hurt you, even without Przingis, who gives them a whole nother dynamic. But Jalen Brown's playing confident, playing unbelievable. Jason Tatum is doing what he does. Derek White, we've been saying all year long, he's probably the most valuable, best role player in the NBA. He's the best shot blocking defender uh, guard in the NBA. And then you have Drew Holiday, who kind of gives you a combination of everything, who can clamp, who makes huge plays down the stretch, who can go get you a bucket, who can overpower the opposing point guard. So, yeah, I think that they have it all. They're versatile. They defend. They score. The only issue we had with them all season long was their depth. But they seem to be getting so much from Horford with Przingis out. Pritchard steps up. Hauser's been struggling, but he was kind of, he got hot a little bit uh, throughout the season. So what they have is enough, and they've been blessed with pretty good health outside of Przingis. And it does, it just, it feels like their time. They've had some fortunate bounces go their way with injuries against the teams they're playing. Um, but you can't discredit what they've done. They've handled business. They've lost two games, and they've looked dominant throughout the postseason. Uh, it's funny because depending on your stance on on this series or this Celtics team specifically, you can spin it one of two ways. You can say, A, uh, the Pacers led in three of the four games late, and then maybe that means the Celtics' clutch issues are dead and gone forever. Or if you want to take the negative angle, you could say, why are they even that close to begin with when you're playing a team that is clearly a, a lesser caliber team than the Celtics? I don't know which one of those you want to take, Chandler. Um, they did come back. They did have these big wins in the end. It was fun to see Jalen Brown smiling. Which, which angle are you taking? Like you said, you could do both because the Pacers tricked off a lot of these games. Three of these games, they uh, mm. they, they could have easily won. This series could be all knotted up right now to the least at 2-2. Two, two. Just the, the, the no timeouts, the turnovers down the stretch. And yeah, you can say Boston kind of rushed them, kind of made, made them play into that. But th this was mismanaged. This was mis-executed by the Pacers. And what's scary for the Celtics is you look ahead – and obviously that series isn't over, but the Dallas Mavericks have been so good late. They've been so good in the end of games, fourth quarter, and that's where Boston has struggled. So looking ahead, they really need to clean that up. Um, but this was probably the most competitive sweep I've ever mm -hmm. seen. I mean, the, the, like I said, the Pacers should have won a couple of these games. The no foul on the one game in Jalen Brown corner three, the turnover is late. Uh, they clean up a few of those things. This series, like I said, is two to two. So I think you can look at it both ways, but you can't discredit the Celtics for still finishing the game, still hitting big shots, still making huge stops. I mean, they won the one game on a Drew Holiday defensive steal, just that didn't even allow a shot to get up. So they did do things like that that were very, very clutch. But there is concerns here going against possibly the hottest team down the stretch in the Dallas Mavericks in the finals.
That, that I think uh, we're all waiting to see what that looks like. Shams, what was your big takeaway from this series? Closing. That's the biggest aspect that changed the entire series. Three out of four games, Indiana could have said we had a chance to win in these games. And that turns around a whole series. Indiana's inability to close these games. And last night, what I saw is Jalen Brown taking a lot of the onus late in the game to go close out that win. 10 points in that quarter, rebound, an assist, a block, a steal, three of six from the field, two three pointers. He was a plus six in the fourth quarter. I saw a few of those plays down the stretch where he was the one who was initiating the offense, closing for the Celtics. Jason Tatum, he had a tremendous game as well. And really a a great series overall. I think both players, this is what makes this Boston team and this Celtics uh, roster so elite. They've got two of the the game's top 10, 15 players in, in the world. And the fact that they're both on the Celtics, they're both willing and able to coexist. That's the biggest thing. I remember I spoke to Jalen Brown a year ago at, at this point, and he told me the fact that they both understand and have great respect for each other's games and know how each, each other are great. They don't have to be hanging out on the court all the time, even though our own Lou Williams said they have, uh, but mm-hmm. they don't need to be showing that, that emotion on the court with each other. Uh, they know what each other's about, and they're both willing to take turns, last night at least, closing out the Indiana Pacers. Well, don't even worry because we did see emotion last night when they called out Jalen Brown's name for Eastern Conference MVP. He looked a little surprised uh, even before the big grin broke out over his face. His numbers are fractionally lower than Jason Tatum's were in this series, but he also had some some of those big moments. You don't even get in overtime uh, without all that. So any controversy here, Chandler? Would you have made the argument differently? No, I don't think it matters. I think this is just Jalen Brown was unbelievable in those first two games. He was the best player. Now looking at it four games in with a sweep, you can see the stats are are pretty similar. It could have went either way. I think the corner three that Jalen Brown hit, I think kind of gives him the nod. Uh, Some plays down the stretch defensively, like his his block shot uh, last night towards the end of the game was huge. And so I think this is a great problem for them to have. We're talking about which one is the the series MVP, which one is the conference finals MVP? That's mm-hmm. a great problem to have when they're both being efficient. They're both being dominant. They're both so versatile, right? They can score off the block. They can handle the ball. They can play a two-man game. Uh, they can get out in transition. So there's nothing offensively that these guys can't do. And Jalen Brown deserves it. Everyone knows Jason Tatum is he's the best player on the team. He's, he's always going to be that. He's always going to be in the hunt for all NBA. He's always going to be up there with MVP voting. But the fact that Jalen Brown now can go in the Eastern Conference Finals, step up, get Eastern Conference MVP, kind of puts people on notice that, look, he's for real. He Yes, he's fine right now being a Robin to a Batman, but – if anything were to happen, Jalen Brown can easily be that number one guy. And he showed it throughout this series. I mean, those numbers don't lie. 30 a game, 52 from the field. That's impressive. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the prop, they have a great problem because you say he's always, Tatum's always going to be the best player. And I, I think that the best case scenario that they have going is that he doesn't have to always be the best player and that he has a guy right there that can pick it up. Then you you snub him by not putting them on an all NBA team. And I think that was the most dangerous thing that everybody could have possibly done. How great uh, a set of weapons do these guys have that you have these two powerhouses on any given night and then all of the other pieces that you never know who's showing up from night to night. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Look at the Mavericks. Luka is their best player, right? But Kyrie Irving could easily win Western Conference Finals MVP. Like he could win the Finals MVP if they happen to win it. He is that dynamic offensively. Same thing here in Boston. There's a lot of duos in the league. When you look at the Suns, the Clippers, you know, the Sixers healthy, Joel Embiid's their best player, but Maxi can easily go and win an award like this. So it just depends on who gets hot during that stretch, during that series. And they both were very, very good, and they both were efficient. So, again, if we're sitting here and we're nitpicking them on now on, on uh, you know, who's going to win MVP, that's a good sign for them because that means they're winning games. That means they're dominating. And, again, it's time to stop this narrative that they're also not friends either because it does. It, let's say they're not friends. They still can produce. They're still playing and winning at an elite level, and they don't need to be high-fiving and smiling and hugging each other. Yeah, that's cool. We like to hear, see that in Dallas. We like to, the you know, the stories with Ant and Towns. That's not who these guys are. These guys are business as usual. They respect the game. They continue and they continue to dominate and they have been nothing but fantastic this entire postseason. So the fact that they have two guys that can go and win an MVP award in a given series is a great problem to have. 
Chandler, we need them to hug or we just yeah. can't buy in. Uh, speaking of dudes that can randomly just show up, Derek White, yay! 16 points, five steals, three blocks, uh, and of course the game-winning three, the biggest shot of them all with 43 seconds left in that one. Love to see it, Chandler. Love to see it. Do you like it as much as I do? <laughs> and, and none of that is even the most impressive stuff he does. The way he plays defense, the way he gets in passing lane, he is the definition of a guy who excels at things in the basketball court that don't show up in the stat sheet. He's just everywhere. He's a nuisance defensively. He blocks shots at a crazy clip for a guard. And this is an unbelievable big time shot. Think about you. We're talking about these two guys, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown and Derek White goes and hits the go ahead three uh, in the corner to kind of seal this series. So this is the guy that we were talking about as a fringe all-star this year just because how versatile and how productive he was his numbers don't blow you away those are great numbers and for the season they're even less than that but this guy is just such a such an incremental piece you can just plug in with any lineup go small go big he can handle the ball in a two-man game because he makes such good decisions so this guy he's not their best player but he damn near is their most valuable player just because everything that he brings and we haven't even gotten to Drew Holiday yet, who was unbelievably yeah. defensively. So that's what I, when, when we're talking about their depth, it, it's it's not an issue when you have these four guys and then you throw on a Porzingis where you have such a dynamite starting five. Their bench can be solid, but if they're getting this production from these guys, it, it, it's unbelievable. They fit, they play well together, they play hard, and they defend. And there it was, Shams, Christophs Porzingis. We obviously haven't seen him in uh, almost a month, really. Uh, do we expect him back with this big, big break in between for game one of the finals? There's definitely hope. There's definitely optimism. There's still some hurdles, I'm told, that he has to clear before he can play in game one of the finals. But there's, of course, hope that this next week plus will give him the time that he needs to ramp up and get ready for that game one next Thursday against, you know, likely the Mavericks, they're going to need him. And that's what the Celtics over the last few weeks, that's what they've been stressing is, yes, we're like we'd love to get him back on the floor. And he wants to play as soon as possible. But with these calf strains, especially the non-contact calf strain that Christoph Sposing has had, very similar to the one Giannis had. And Giannis said four weeks after the injury that it, he was just starting to run at 40, 50 percent. And so Porzingis has to make sure he's 100 percent healthy. This could of course, lead to worse injuries if you do end up getting back on the floor sooner than you're supposed to. But there's obviously hope the next week and a half he's able to ramp up and get ready. By the way, Shams, can we talk about these headlines, these storylines coming up with a possible finals with Przingis going back to Dallas and Kyrie mm -hmm. going back to Boston? Like, my God, that is going to be fun. <laughs> I do. I feel like we're jinxing it, though, Chandler. Like everyone just assumes Dallas is going to make it. And granted, it looks really, really rough for Minnesota right now. And, and we got a few hours to figure that out. But that is going to be fun. Kyrie going back to Boston. I've already talked to a couple friends, diehard Celtics fans. They're like, I will be nice. But the rest of the arena is not going to be nice. So I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Um, but the Kristaps Porzingis, little, obviously, they didn't need him to get this far. And you can say whatever you want about the opponents they faced already. But do the Celtics need or Zingas Chandler to win the finals. Yeah, I think they do. And, and I think, again, those four guys that we just talked about, they're talented enough to win games and make it competitive with or without Porzingis. But he does give them a whole nother look uh, offensively. He can pick and pop. He can stretch the floor. He does things that those other guys cannot do. And Al Horford has been great. <laughs> he's filled in very well. He's been shooting the ball great. Defensively, he struggled a little bit. But, yeah, when you're talking about a team like Dallas – uh, or or Minnesota, if they do happen to make history and come back down 3-0, which we don't see happening. They do have size, they have length, uh, and that does present a challenge with with, with uh, the Celtics being so thin up front with just Horford, with Cornette, her. They need Przingis to compete to bang with them, but th 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 it'll be competitive regardless. But I do think with Przingis, with them fully loaded, I think the Celtics are still the team to beat come the finals, whoever they play. But... Yeah, Przingis just brings them this element that they don't have. They play a two-man game. He picks and pops. He rolls. He's very good at getting a switch on with a smaller guy and just simply shooting over him and taking a, taking advantage of that mismatch. So I do think they are that much better with Przingis in the lineup, and it gives them a huge advantage if he's able to go.
Nice long rest. Get get as much as you can, Shams. Look, you could say whatever you want. This Pacers season, um, I'm sure they think maybe it's a failure. Maybe they think there's a lot to grow on, things to build on. I think it was a hell of a season for a team that maybe didn't have those expectations. Um, what can we expect off season wise? Are, are they planning on adding, subtracting, what? The Pacers' biggest responsibility this summer, their biggest priority, is bringing back Pascal Siakam. And he averaged 21.3 points a game, almost eight rebounds a game, led the Pacers in both stats uh, once he got to the team in the 40-plus games that he played. The heavy lifting on the Pascal Siakam front has been done on both sides. Pascal Siakam, the Raptors, couldn't agree to an extension. He gets traded, and the Pacers, for their part, give up three first-round draft picks to go get him. They didn't just trade those picks to potentially just have a crack at keeping him. They understand it's a maximum level of contract commitment that you're going to have with Pascal Siakam. That's what they're preparing to offer him this summer, and he wants to be there. There's mutual interest in getting a deal done. So that's their first priority. They're going to keep an open mind with other moves that they could make potentially as well. But I would expect this summer to be a little quiet in Indiana. You got your big move this season. You have Tyrese Halliburton. Uh, obviously, we saw Andrew Nemhard, the steps that he took. They have a couple of young players, Ben Mather and Ben Shepard, uh, Obi Toppin. They've got guys that they know that they can build with around the veteran players. So th- it'll be a lot of internal improvement in Indy and, of course, bringing back Pascal Siakam. You love that, Chandler? That's a no-brainer, right? Yeah, what's interesting is you don't give up that much to not re-sign him. So if that's the price, if the price is a max contract, that's what you have to do. And I think he put people on notice this offseason was just the way he can score the ball, the way he uses his size, his versatility. He can hoop. And I think people didn't expect him to be this good. I know he was great in Toronto uh, during those runs, but he took a next step for me this year. He was he was a great fit with Halliburton. And Shams mentioned it, but Benedict Matherin is an absolute stud. So we talked about Jimmy Butler being out for the Heat and Donovan Mitchell being out for the Cavs. This dude was out for the Pacers, and he's just as valuable. He's such a weapon offensively. He can go get you buckets in a m- multiple different ways. So I do think they have the pieces. Miles Turner's great. TJ McConnell was fantastic all, all series long, all playoffs long. He They didn't miss a beat. When Halbert went out, they put McConnell in. He was fantastic. And Nimhart, Shams touched on him. It, it, listen, I think he's a future star. I, I can't say that yet, but he's he is an NBA talented player. He's a starting guard in this league. He showed with how big he is, how how he can make clutch shots. He's fearless. So they do have the pieces. You look around the landscape of the Eastern Conference, it's going to be tough with everybody fully healthy. The league is just too deep right now to say they're a contender next year. But yeah, I think first things first, you re-sign Siakam. You, you have your core going forward. And then you have all these pieces like Obi Toppin, like Shepard, like McConnell, all these role players that just play hard and know their role. And they play in a fun system. Rick Carlisle's offense is fun. Guys want to play that fast pace, shoot a bunch of threes. And they've found the pieces to do that successfully. So hell of a season. Definitely not a disappointment. No one expected the Indiana Pacers to make the Eastern Conference Finals this year. Uh, Losing their best player, this is just too tall of a task. But uh, hell of a season and an unbelievable job. I mean, and they were competitive. It's, I mean, look, I get it. it. When it's all said and done, we won't remember this five years from now, the context of it all. And it was a sweep, but it wasn't if you were watching it. It actually felt a very competitive way. It's funny that you say, Andrew Nemhard, you're not sure whether he's a future star or not. Mike Breen threw it out there, said he's for sure a future star. The fact that you could plug him in with Tyrese Halliburton out and, and he showed up in the way he did. What would you need to see from him to put him in one of those leap categories? Just more of it. I think we need to stop putting these expectations on players. Stop calling Anthony Edwards Michael Jordan. Stop calling this kid a future star. <laughs> Just let him play. Let him grow. Let him blossom. It takes time. He's had a great playoffs. No one knew who he was. I, I looked up, I had to look up his contract during the game last night. So I'm like, damn, this dude is good. He signed like a four year, $8 million deal. So Whoa. they got him in a bargain. So, I mean, I'm assuming they're going to end up ripping that up and extending him or something because you don't want to let this kid hit free agency. But he is a very, very good player, and he shows he belongs. He shows that he is a contributor. He, he's such a – he played at the University of Florida, so I, I was on him. He ended up transferring to Gonzaga. He's always been smart. He's always had a really good IQ, can pass the ball, but now he's kind of developing this offensive game. He's crafty. He had a cra- He didn't even finish last night, but he had a crazy move where he went up and under and, and absolutely just lost Drew Holiday on a shot fake. He's got game, and I think he is the perfect pair to have with Tyrese Halliburton because he can play the two position as well. They can play together. He can be that off guard. Um, 
but they have a lot. I love Aaron Neesmith. Like they have so many different players here that you can just plug in and go. No matter who's in, no matter who's available, the Pacers show that they can compete on any given night because they have the right guys that play hard and play the right way. And Andrew Nemhard's one of them. Nemhard Neesmith. It really makes you think. Uh, we got some breaking news. Actual breaking news with some scoops from Shams. I just saw you tweet it. It's like you're doing everything at once, Shams. Talk to me. So Derek Lively, the big man for the Mavericks, he's out with the next sprain. But I'm told after three and a half weeks with an AC joint separation in his shoulder, Maxi Kleber has been cleared to return tonight. The Mavericks are one win away from the NBA Finals. They did not really expect Kleber to be back until maybe the NBA Finals at the earliest into the NBA Finals. But he has been cleared to play tonight. Uh, I, I would expect limited minutes for Maxi Kleber. But the fact that he's ready to give them whatever it is, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, Tonight in this game, he practiced yesterday, scrimmaged, uh, and he has been cleared to make his return tonight. Kleber's clear, Chandler. I mean, that's maybe they do get the sweep done. Stop wasting yeah. time. Well, this is <laughs> valuable. Like Sean said, no matter how many minutes he plays, just to get him reps, just to get his legs back, and looking ahead, looking at the Boston Celtics, if they have Przingis coming back, Maxi Kleber is a perfect matchup for them. Lively, it's tough. Gafford, it's tough. Przingis plays more like a guard. Now you have Maxi Kleber, who is that versatile defender, who had a lot of success this year in the fourth quarter down the stretch when they went small. Maxi Kleber was their guy. Uh, so it was a huge blow and they lost him. And now with the uncertainty of Lively and him being out, you get Maxi Kleber back, who provides outside shooting, who provides defensive capabilities that those two bigs can't do. And with Porzingis coming back, this is a huge, huge help for them. So hopefully, he plays at least 15, 20 minutes tonight, get get some, get it back, and and this is a this is a great addition for Dallas. It's an exciting moment, Shams. You also had some news on Bronny James. What's the latest? Yeah, Bronny James has over 10 workout invites uh, during the pre-draft process, but I'm told he's only going to visit a couple of those, and that's going to include the Lakers and the Phoenix Suns. The Suns have the number 22 overall pick in the draft. He's under consideration there among, obviously, a lot of players at, at 22, but it's going to come down to the development plan. It's going to come down to guaranteed money, uh, whether it's late in the first round, in the second round. But the fact that there's only going to be a couple teams, two, three teams that Bronny James visits and the Lakers and Suns, interestingly, are among the two teams. <laughs> Just looking at Chandler's face. Hmm? Anything you want to add? Or? Uh, the 22nd pick, uh, that's, that's a great pick. It's it's a high pick. Uh, no, I, I, I got nothing. Listen, we, we talk about it all wait. the time. You don't want to discredit this kid just because of who his father is in this situation. I just personally, as a basketball, take away his name, tell me a different name, and I'm just watching him as a basketball player. I don't know if he's the 22nd pick. So th that's where all, my only confusion is. I was the SEC player of the year, and I was the 38th pick. Like, I like I just, it, <laughs> it's not uh -huh. adding up. I, I haven't seen him work out. I haven't seen his, prog uh, his, his progress. But again, you can't just discredit him because of the situation. He's just a kid trying to make it. But here's the deal, because you have to be fair, right? You can't discredit him because of who his dad is, but we all have to be realistic about why he's getting so much coverage at the same time. Can't have it both ways. I mean, it not is rockets. what it's it is. It's not rocket science. Yeah, it really isn't. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, the icon, Nancy Lieberman, joins the show. What is, ooh, it's art. They're making art on her end. I love it. All right, we'll be right back. Run it up, run it back, yeah, yeah. Run it up, run it back, run it up, run it back, run it up, run it back. Nancy Lieberman, the Hall of Famer. Hall of Fame. Friends call her magic. Hall of Fame. One of the greatest basketball minds. How about that? Yes, she is here, the icon, the Hall of Famer. She also calls the games for the OKC Thunder. Nancy Lieberman here. I know you got monster storms in that Dallas area, so we appreciate it. Maybe we can distract you for the next several minutes from what's going on outside. Um, we're so big on determining whether a season was a failure or a success, right? And I think fans determine it or, or define it differently. You call these Thunder games. You're sitting there watching them up close and personally. How would you deem the season they just had? It was absolutely remarkable. I mean, so many individual players had uh, career success in what they did. Uh, Chet uh, Holgram showed the world that he's got some swag. He's not afraid. He's going to come after you. 
And uh, he's got that, you know, three-level skill set at what he can do. I think he might have been the only player in the history of the NBA to have uh, 100 threes, 100 uh, blocks, and 100 uh, – what was the other thing he did? There was three three categories. But uh, what he did was absolutely remarkable. I thought the reason they were plus 17 uh, as far as regular season wins – was because they had a true person at the front of the rim that could change your shot, block your shot, or get in your head about not coming to the rim and kicking it out. So he did a really great job and, and complimented, you know, Shea and, and J Dub and uh, J Will and all those guys. It was a pretty cool season. Nancy, of course, the they they struggled. Uh, with rebounding all year, what would you do if you were the Thunder going into this offseason? What would you look to add? Well, you know, I mean, Sam Presti has 392 draft picks over the next three years. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, you know, obviously like he's loaded with these draft picks. <laughs> he's done such an amazing job. He is so smart. And how he systematically has built this this team into a contender, uh, obviously they need to get somebody who could help. If they had somebody like a Gafford who could just do dirty work, block shots, run the floor, uh, you know, throw it to the rim and, and really just rebound. That's what, you know, Jay will, you know, out of Arkansas. I mean, he's a hell of a player. He just gets outmatched at certain times when he gets- we might be having some technical difficulties uh, with Nancy. As I mentioned, she's in the, the heart of the storm there in the Dallas metropolitan area. So much so that Shams can't even get to the game. Clear up the skies. We'll, we'll figure some stuff Thanks. out. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll keep it going. This is Run It Back. Well, might as well preview it. Don't know how many more we're going to get, but... T-Wolves must win Sitch tonight. They don't want to get swept. Luke and Kyrie have led this team to a 3 nothing lead. Uh, that last game was a 116-107. Luke got 33. Kyrie, 33. Anthony Edwards had 26 points, 9 rebounds, 9 assists. Um, but Kyrie Irving has really just been a, a, a reminder, a revelation to those who maybe forgot. 27 points on 9 for 12 from the field. 5-6 uh, of six from 3, by the way, over his last two fourth quarters. Afterwards, Luca called him Mr. Fourth Quarter. Might work on that nickname, but where does he rank Chandler amongst closers in your mind? He's up there. He, he, he's up there. It's hard to put a number on it, but he has been so good. And he's been doing this for years. And the best thing about Kyrie Irving is he's just hoop. He's just hooping now. He's happy. He knows how to play with stars. He's done this before with LeBron. Now he does it well with, with Luca. He has no problem being one B in certain games, and then he knows when to take over. He knows when to be aggressive. He can tell. It, 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 it just he, he's got a great chemistry, a great morale with Luca already. He gets everyone else involved. He kind of feels out the games in the beginning. Sometimes he's aggressive. Sometimes he's more <laughs> passive. So he's got a really, really good understanding. And this is the, this is the key with this du- with this duo too. You look at Oklahoma City. SGA was very good, but J Dub would close a lot of the games. Jason Tatum is very good. Jalen Brown is very good on the stretch. So when you have this dynamic duo where they both can go off and they both understand that it doesn't matter who gets the awards, who wins the conference MVP, when it translates to wins, that's when they figure it out. And these guys have figured it out. They kind of wrote them off last year when it didn't work early. It took time. And now they're peaking and they look great. And the guys that they got around them with with P.J. Washington and Derek Jones Jr., they are thriving in this role. So everyone's getting involved. Everyone's happy. Everybody's contributing. And it's like I said, it's translating to wins, which is unbelievable. The fact that they're here in the first place is a success. The fact that they're up 3-0 to the best defensive team and a team that's been so elite offensively, it's, it's crazy impressive. Lou, did you need to be reminded of who Kyrie was? <laughs> 
No, but uh, he's been on a he's been on a tear to make sure everybody got the reminder. You know, Luca calling him Mr. Fourth Quarter that tells you the balance of of what they need to be successful. You know, Luca does all the heavy lifting early on in games. Come fourth quarters when they're still blitzing him or he's seeing that drop, he's a willing passer, giving that ball to number eleven and allowing Kyrie Irving to do his thing. And Kyrie's been carrying him to the finish line. And then once you need a game winning shot, we go right back to Luca Doncic. That's what's made this team so dangerous in this postseason, especially against the Minnesota Timberwolves. You got to think, we were praising this defense. We were praising the way that they were able to guard how many different looks and the size that they have in order to be able to guard Dallas. And Dallas has been, done a, a tremendous job of just picking through it and making it look like a mediocre defense when we know they're a high-level defensive team in all statistical categories. But Luka and Kyrie, they're so good on the offensive end. They've made this team look like they can't guard at all, and it's going to be tough for Minnesota to try to squeak one out at the end of this series now. They really have made them look like a mediocre defensive team. It's very confusing. Uh, special guest joining us now. I love this for us. He's a two-time champ, a four-time All-Star. Yay, Rajon Rondo joins the show. I know you're going to be busy. These We got nine days uh, to kill, up, Rondo, between this uh, awesome between last night and the finals. So welcome. Really? Nine days? Nine days. for the, Well, he's for Boston. We'll see what Dallas <laughs> what ends up with. What the hell are we going to um, talk about for nine days? What, what are we going to talk about? Well, we're going to start now. Um, Jalen Brown named Eastern Conference MVP. No one seems to have any issue with it is do you agree with the assessment there 1000 percent. you know he uh game two he set a, a record uh made history as well 40 points and the conference final playoffs ended the game with a closeout game last night with 29 so um there's no argument here they're a very unselfish team that's what i love about this team um you know it's, it's a different person every night uh, they're allowed to uh, be themselves there's no one jealous on the team coach Missoula has done a great job in the locker room of finding guys to be able to you know be unselfish you know want the best for the next man beside him so um, that's why this team has done what they've done so far, uh, and I look forward to them, you know, me personally winning the championship. Go, mm -hmm. so Jason Tatum has been in the conference finals five times in seven right. seasons. Only one trip to the NBA finals, and and not a ring yet. Is this playoff? Is this is this a legacy kind of moment for him to kind of get over the hump and get a championship this year? I believe it's probably his best shot. Um, I don't know about legacy hump because again he's he's such a young you know young talent. I think he's 25 years old. So uh, we talk about him as if he's you know the, one of the older OGs in, in the game. So for me, he's still a young guy. Like I said, I'm the kudos to Brad Stevens who's uh, kept those guys together all these years. You know, some teams like to blow guys up when they don't get it done, especially in, uh, as a Celtic. You know, even though the conference finals is not what we hang as far as banners, it's about championships. But they allow these guys to grow, continue to grow as young men, as young players, uh, continue to trust each other. Uh, and like I said, they brought in a, a hell of an adjustment by bringing in Joe Mazzula. Uh, shout out to my man Sam Castillo. Their coaching staff done a hell of a job this year. And they, they don't, you know, they, they deserve more credit. And when they will do it uh, when they win the championship. Though that's, that's what I wanted to ask you. Put your, put your coach's hat on for me for a second. You said that it will be a failure if they didn't win a <laughs> right. You said it'll be a failure if they didn't win a championship this year. What's one glaring issue you see that, uh, cause that could prevent them from winning it all? Ooh, it's a tough one. Um, I mean, I think this going away from what this guy in there this far, you know what I mean? Just trusting the next man beside you. Uh, their defense is unmatched. You know, I, like, I know you said earlier about how uh, Dallas is making Minnesota's defense look sweet, but at the end of the day, um, like I said, you got a guy that's been there four or five times. You got a mixture of guys that have one in Drew Holiday, guys that have in Al Horford. Uh, like I said, the young stars, Tatum and uh, and Brown. So uh, you need that type of mixture to win a championship. And I think they have the DNA, they have the makeup. And they've been the most consistent team all, all throughout the playoffs. Um, you know, despairing that, you know, there have been some injuries, a couple of teams they played against, regardless, never the fact they haven't made it a series. You know what I mean? They, do, they took care of business, got it done. Uh, and like I said, allowing themselves to rest. Think about it. They're the only team that's really not beat up in the playoffs. Um, you know, besides Porzingis, other yeah. than that, guys aren't playing, you know, 39 minutes a game. Like, they're able to, you know, to rest their body. And that's big. As you see, Luca. Um, you know, not necessarily slowing down, but obviously he's grimacing or something every game. And, you know, it takes a toll on you throughout the entire playoffs to play this long, just play this many games to get to a finals. I know back in the way we played 26 games to win a championship. So, um, you know, again, we were a deep team, so it wasn't to where, you know, it was, you know, we had guys that was in the finals and that was hurt or banged up. You know, everyone's hurt in the end of the day, but at the same time, the Celtics are probably going to be the more fresher team. Obviously, they go to, they go to, um, they're going to have to play in Boston. 
and uh, it's going to the garden's going to be rocking. So it's going to be a tough one, but you know, it's what the finals is about. I'm looking forward to it. Not counting Minnesota out, but again, obviously you do the numbers. Teams are three zero; they don't come back from that. So uh, I'm looking forward to you know Kyrie going back to the garden. Hopefully, Porzingis gets better. Him going back to Dallas. It's, it's a dope storytelling, uh, and we'll see the end of the story. Hopefully, when it comes through within nine days. But you you think they you think they're <laughs> confident that they get it done this go around though, right? Oh, cease absolutely. Um, yeah, for sure. For sure, yeah. I think so. Yeah, I'm willing to. I'm a, you know it's, we can bet now, so. Uh, Willing to bet a little bit on the Celtics. Yes, we can. <laughs> uh, shout out, no, but shout out to my man, you know, Jay Kidd, Jay Dully. You know, like I said, we, we speak often. Um, I, I'm actually going to Dallas here this weekend, possibly, and, um, you know, with my AU team. So, like I said, I look forward to, like, introducing the guys, some of the players. So, now nah, there's just some of my player players on that team. You know, shout out to Kyrie Irving. I tell my son to watch him. He's one of the greats. Uh, all facets of the floor, three-level score. So, um, you know, like I said, it's going to be a tough one, but at the end of the day, I think I got to go with my C's. No, we had uh, we had Scalabrini on, and and he you had mentioned the team from 2008, and he had always picked them over your guys' 08 team until watching this playoffs. He flipped and now said he would <laughs> take your guys' 08 team over this year's Celtics team. Are you do you agree with that, or do you think this team has the edge over us? Everybody um, taking 08. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't see that. Like I said, I, I can't. I can't talk. Oh, my bad. I can't, I can't talk down on this team, obviously. Um, you know, it's still, uh, you know, they have a, a long way to go. Uh, it's not going to be easy championship. But at the end of the day, I'm going to go with my C's, man. I'm going to go with my OA team, obviously, because, um, you know, we were dogs and we, and we went after each other. Uh, not, no disrespect to them. Like I said, they got a bunch on that team at the same time, but we, we would have got them boys. Hmm. Reg- Rajan, Kevin Garnett, obviously known as the best trash talker on those Celtics teams, probably yes. of his era. What was the craziest thing you heard KG say on the court? Uh, I can say it here. <laughs> yep. No, I'm not. Look at Vito. Yeah. Vito, yep. So I was um, like, yep, do it. <laughs> he said some wild shit. I mean, but P, P takes a cake for me probably. You know what I mean? He's, mm. he, he said something crazy to Richard Jefferson at the free throw line, and it was like kind of like my welcome to the league moment. I'm like, damn, like this is, this is normal. Like you could talk to people like this in the game and like, you know, he didn't respond as I would thought he did, but it's always like, you know, what P said to Richard Jefferson, I'm not going to say it, but he, he um, it was like my second year in the league, and I'll never forget. I was like, oh, shit, this is the league. So it was really P that kind of stood out versus Kevin. Kevin just talked shit all day long, nonstop. Um, you know, he but was a very, you know, one of the most. KG, though, he was scared me because he would just talk shit to himself. He's fucking scared. Right, that's what I said, so it's not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It, it was always more so, like I said, in, in the sense of, you know, the team. He, he'll talk to, obviously, individuals at the same point and same time as well. But he was nonstop, you know, from first quarter to fourth. You know, like I said, he's bumping. He used to bump me in the goddamn layup line uh, when we were warming up. And I'm like, I'm, I'm on your teammate, big fella. So, uh, you know, like I said, he's an all-time competitor. Uh, I would look go to war with him. He's probably my first pick. If I was to go to war with anybody I've ever played with, it would be definitely him on the front line with me. So, I feel like Paul doesn't put limits on himself. And KG is like the crazy guy at the corner who's just talking to himself all day long and you don't know if you want to walk by or across the street. Like, that's how I feel. Correct. Is that how it is? Because Paul, I mean, I worked with Paul. He can say some things <laughs> that are yeah, like, he is. I mean, and, that, and that was on TV. So I can't even imagine right, what I'm he's saying you, out there. What about the early Paul Pierce? I mean, like I said, just, when he was, you know, Mr. Himself, you know, Mr. Celtic himself at that time, he was, a, he was an animal. Um, like I said, yeah. I went to Paul Pierce University. I went to Kevin University. So... Uh, I've got a lot of great bets that I've took a lot of things from as far as in that aspect of the game and also off the court as well. So it's just like it's, it's fun. It was a good time. Um, you had a there's a story KG's recounted already that uh, there was a, an altercation verbal between you and he. And then you ended up choking <laughs> on some water uh, and he refused to help you. I, I'm trying to paint the picture there. How how does this go what? down? <laughs> uh, so we were um, at the practice. Uh, you know, like I said, our practice are very heated. And I think after practice, we probably played one-on-ones. We used to call them G-unit runs. And um, that was, you know, we played one-on-ones, and you really couldn't call foul unless you were bleeding or somebody really fucked you up. So um, we were playing, obviously, ones. We get into it. We get in, you know, we get a heat altercation. And really, we didn't obviously get physical. We kind of charged each other. People got in the middle of it. You know, he's talking shit. I'm talking shit. Um, our lockers were pretty far apart. So, like I said, there was a lot of guys in the locker room that kind of kept us from getting at each other. Um, and then I don't know what happened. Like I said, I'm sitting in my locker. Next thing you know, I'm trying to relax, calm down. I drink some water and I start choking. 
And all I can hear this motherfucker say is choke, motherfucker, choke, choke, choke. I'm like, what the fuck? So he really was like, you know, I would say he was wishing my death at that time, but he was he was intense, yo. I don't know what the fuck was wrong with him or why he said that. He was telling me to choke while I was choking. So that's incredible. Hey, Terrifying. One of your teammates, uh one of your teammates said you and Ray Allen, y'all put gloves on to settle y'all feud. That's real? Stop, stop. It wasn't a settle feud, but we damn sure put the gloves on. Um Shout All out right. to Beto. Um, he was our strength and condition coach at the time. And like I say, we, we were competitive every every facet of life. We always competed. And at that particular time, I think T.A., Tony Allen, and Big Baby put the gloves on. Uh, Big Baby set him down quickly. Patrick uh, O'Brien, P, put the gloves on. And then me and Ray, me and Ray put Jeez. the gloves on. So, uh, who, 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 who won y'all round? I got to know who won y'all round. Who won yeah. I round? Man, that's, I got to let my peers say, you know, tell you that I can't really. I don't want to talk that's about real, it. That that's real. Um, you know, and nowadays you can run it back. You know what I mean? That's what celebrities do now. So, um, no, nah, it was just all fun and games at the time. <laughs> you know, we like I said, we love to compete. B do bought the gloves in. We was like, shit, fuck it, let's get it on. You know what I mean? Because there was no point of talking about each other behind each other's back. Let's just fight as men. But it got broken up pretty quickly. Um, but like I said, we was fighting in the weight. Well, we were boxing in the weight room, and you know, you know, equipment got hit a little bit. People got knocked back, type of thing. So it was. We ended it kind of quickly. But it, it, it didn't go three rounds. It didn't go three minutes. It was probably like uh hey, that's, a, that's a different time in the league, boy. <laughs> they, y'all do that now. They might suspend the whole team now. What? That the was whole a team. Time. Dude, get, the guy bringing the gloves, <laughs> getting fired, everything. It's over. It's, Catch a loss. Everybody yeah. getting fired. It's a different time. <laughs> a lawsuit. <laughs> Good old days. Wow. Rajan, you have said that you and Doc didn't see eye to eye uh, early in his tenure there in Boston, but... Did you really break a TV when Doc made a film session all okay. about you? So let me let me clear that up. Doc and I, we didn't see eye to eye, but I, Doc is one of my favorite coaches of all time. You know what I mean? It's like um, yeah. a coach that's held you accountable for the first time in your career um, once I got to the pros. You know what I mean? Even though it was my first year, um, I wouldn't say in college I got that same type of treatment. So, um, you know, we, we did butt heads at times. Like I said, I was, I saw one thing, he saw a different thing. And obviously Doc played, you know, the game at a high level at the point guard position. So for him trying to mentor me and teach me break bad habits, you know, how to be continue to be a great leader. Um, I think that was the, you know, the, the disconnect. But at the same time, again, he's my favorite coach. He's the coach that allowed me to become who I am. Uh, he gave me the keys to the, to the engine early at, at 20 years old, you know, with three first battle hall of famers. So, uh, it was it was a learning moment. They brought in Sam Cassell to help teach me. You know, me help curve that you know, that gap between Doc and I. So it was a great you know job for the organization to kind of make that relationship work. So um, that's my guy. I'm glad that you said all that because obviously he had a crazy season. Starts out on TV, ends up coaching the Bucks. They get out in the first round. They got injuries. All, all the bad things can happen. Pressure. And then you've got <laughs> well, you got the former players coming out and saying it's you know he doesn't have the ability to make adjustments. So. When you hear that, or when you saw how his season ended, did you think it was his fault? Like, where would you place blame? Um, I'm a I'm a player guy. I mean, I feel like you have the personnel, you have the talent. Um, you know, your coaching puts you in position, but again, um, he gave us the keys. He gave me the keys. So uh, it wasn't you know necessarily him continuing to coach and be a dictator, but like we had film sessions where we all talked, we all spoke up, we all thought you know voiced our opinion. Shout out to Coach Thibodeau. So it was a collective team effort. You know, I can't put the blame on one particular head coach. Um, you know, as I say, even the years we didn't win it, we never blamed him. It was always after games. Uh, I know I remember myself, you know, the big three, you know, polls. We would be in the training room on the table after every game figuring out why we lost or why we won. So um, with great players that the Milwaukee Bucks have on their roster, even though Giannis was out, um, I can't blame, you know, like I said, they, got, they had the formula game one. You know, obviously Dane went crazy. Uh, in the first half, but at the same time, as, as a competitor, as a leader on that team, in particular, if I was on that roster, I can't I can't say it's hard to say that, but I definitely believe we wouldn't have got you know beat by the Indiana Pacers, um, you know, especially the way we dominated them in Game One. So it's about adjustments and game plan decisions, but it's not particularly all on one coach. You know what I mean? Like I say, in the, in the game, the players have to make the adjustments at times. In the game, is the coach, the players may have to do something different from what the coaching staff wants, but at the same time, if we're all five on the same page you know, we should make it work. So no, I can't put that up in one doc. So Some responsibility, but not all of it. Yeah. You, you mentioned you guys didn't always see eye to eye, which most time players and coaches don't. Um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you and Rick Carlisle, <laughs> you and Rick Carlisle didn't see eye to eye. And there, Halliburton said you had texted him basically good luck when he got moved to the Pacers because of your history with former Rick Carlisle. 
what what was that? I mean, I was there for a little bit of it. There was some hilarious shit that I remember. But what was the main issue? What was the main beef with Rick with your time at Dallas? Um, I don't have Halliburton's number. Um, but the the issue I think or the the disconnect with, with Rick, I guess I believe obviously I could say you know if I had to say my piece is when I was brought to Dallas, you know, um, they told me they was like, we want you to be J Kid, we want you to be you know vocal, we want you to run the offense, we want you to you know, do your thing as far as uh, quarterback in the team. And I'm like, I can't be J.K. and I can be myself, but we have a lot of great similarities. So, of course, it's what I do. You know, I'm playing with the big three. Um, Doc allowed me to, to grow into this player that can quarterback and run the show. Um, so, obviously, I get there a couple months in. Um, obviously, you there, Monte there. Um, shout out to Coach Daryl Armstrong. That's who, I got, that's who helped me get through the season. But at the first month I'm there, I'm just trying to sit back and learn. I'm a sponge. I'm trying to figure out Rick's coaching styles. I'm trying to figure out, okay, where does Dirk like the ball? Where does CP like the ball? Where does Monte like the ball? You know, you all are a big three. So I'm like, for me, you know, I've done this before. It's deja vu. I can, I can manage this. So, again, I let the offense go. I'm trying to figure out what Rick wants from us as a team. And then, obviously, that one particular game, you know, I'm in my mind, I'm, you know, I'm uh, manipulating the game. So I know Dirk has a, he had a couple of buckets on one side of the floor, so I try to flip the play to the other side. And that's when Rick was like, what the fuck are you doing? I'm like, my man, like, I, this is, this is, I'm thinking, I'm plugging in, this is Kevin Garnett. Okay, you go up, two players on one side of the floor, let's go opposite side, we're going to get an easier bucket for, for dirt. And he, you know, he starts stomping and shit like that on the floor. And I'm, you know, as a man, it's like, bro, you, you know, you're disrespectful, my man. Like, you know, I'm a, I'm a champion at the same time. You know, I give you a lot of respect. I came in here, I didn't say shit. And then for you to come at me like I'm a, you know, a, a young player, a rookie to know what the fuck he's talking about or what he's doing or how to manage a game that's disrespectful for, on top of what you all brought me here to do and what I was told, how you all wanted me to perform as a point guard on this, on this unit. Cause I'm coming to this damn, I'm coming to this opportunity or this organization thinking we're going to win a championship there, USCP. Like I said, I got you, my say, and Dirk damn near almost in, in their prime. So I'm like, this is a layup. And I'm going out to the West, it's sweet in the West. And obviously y'all don't play defense. So for me, you know, coming from the East to the Western conference, I'm thinking like, okay, as I'm on it, cause like I said, Mark Cuban sent me to G5. Me and Dwight Powell. Shout out to Dwight Powell. I mean, he's still there. Uh, so he sent us on. He sent the G5 to pick us up. So, I mean, it's love. They telling me, you know, Mac extension, all this other shit. They telling me a dream. So when I get there, it's not even about, obviously, all that. It's about me winning a championship because I feel like I had the pieces to put in play to win that year, in particular with that group. So it was, you know, it, it didn't go as well. Obviously, it didn't go as planned. Um, the Houston game, when, when they came uh, – when they came out, CP, I know you remember that. I made a play or something. I think I didn't get the ball to court within, you know, the violation time. And at that time, people were like, oh, he quit on the team. I'm like, how the fuck I quit on the team? That's never been my DNA. Obviously, like, I'm going to compete at a whole time level. I don't give a fuck who's on the court with me. I'm going to make it work, and I plan to win. So for them to spend that narrative coming out, you know, um, and then to keep it a buck, I never said this. So what happened in Dallas at the end of, the career, end of my, uh, that season that year, I had a call with Donnie Nelson, Rick Carlisle, Duff, and they like, Rick doesn't want to coach you anymore. So we're going to say your back is hurting and you're done playing. I said, oh, okay, well, fuck it. You know, I'm going to shoot. The, and I shot to Miami. And I just kind of lay low and chilled there. So the narrative was, oh, he quit on the team. Like, them motherfuckers said, Rick doesn't want to coach you with Donnie Nelson on the phone. And like I said, and uh, and, and Doug Gill Duffy. So it's like, okay, fuck it. I don't want to play for Rick. You know what I mean? Like, he's being this nerve. We're going to just say your back hurts and that'll be it. And that's why when I go back to Dallas, every time I get booed, like, as if I quit on organization, I'm like, that's, <laughs> I'm never quitting anything in life. So this whole shit that y'all spending around me, I'm going to take the booze. I'm going to eat this shit for the rest of my career because I don't want to say much. But at the same time, that's not how it went. Yeah. No, CP, and by the, you were there. <laughs> and for the record, no no teammate, no player ever had an issue with, with Rajon Rondo. We love playing with you. So I was always curious. I, I, I just remember there are certain times where you would bring the ball up and he's trying to tell you to call a play. Yeah, You're like, like, bro, just let me rock. Let me go, bro. Like, it's just, I got this. Like, I got weapons out there, bro. Give me, let me do my thing. And again, I ate it for a month because I wanted to learn the system. I didn't come in as if, hey, I know everything I want to do. No. Let me see. Okay, Rick likes this. Okay, this is the place he wants. Okay, CP. Okay, he likes to be on this top of the floor of the floor. Monte, if he gets bliss, I need to put that. Like, I was breaking the game down like that. And it was never an ego thing. It was obviously, this is what I do well is manage the game. So it, it was a whole different narrative. And one more thing, I know I'm going crazy, but it was one more meeting I tried to call with Rick. And this is DK is my witness. You know DK. He was the uh, team psychologist. Mm -hmm. And I called DK because y'all had gone on a road trip. And he came back. And I'm like, I stayed at about 3 in the morning. I was watching film on how I figure out how I can help the team. I didn't go in that particular game. I called DK. I said, DK, come in and meet with me with Rick so I can figure out what's what. 
Next morning, I show up at practice. I go into the office with DK. Rick, I sit down, Rick's across from me, and Rick hands me like damn like a book and was like, this is what you're not doing. I'm like, whoa, like, what the fuck are we talking about, Rick? I'm coming here to try to get on the same page with you as I know I've been taught with Doc Rivers, you know, me being extension of you on the court. I'm trying to get on the same page, and you coming at me throwing daggers, and it's like, damn, you talking about what I ain't doing versus, like, I'm trying to figure out what we can do as a team. So DK, my witness, like I said, I came in there, and that motherfucker came out with guns blazing, and I was like, okay, cool, this shit ain't going to work. Like, I can't. I can't work, make this work. But I'm staying up, dedicating my time, 3 o'clock in the morning, watching y'all on the road from a game we had just, I think, previous loss. I'm thinking of how we can make adjustments. You know, kind of like an like assistant coach at the time. And he came to me as if, you know, I was coming to him. And I was like, man, this, you know, fuck it. it, it this marriage won't work. Uh, Chandler, did he answer your question? <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just want to make sure. Rajan, this has been an absolute pleasure. I hope we get to talk to you again, especially with these finals coming up, man. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Y'all have a good one. No, good luck it, with yo. the boys, my boy. All right, Lou, yes, appreciate sir. you, Lou. Yes, sir. Yeah. Man, Lou, I want to ask, who's the better coach, you or him? I yeah. wanted to get into it, but, you know, it's completely <laughs> different on the girls and the boys' side, you know. Yeah. I, I got I to focus on the fundamentals. He probably got a, a kid on his team that can dunk and do all of that there and bail him out, so it's completely different vibes. That's crazy. <laughs> I will, well, say, we'll have him I will say, he was awesome. He was a great teammate. I had no issues ever in the locker room with that two of players. Up. Never heard a bad thing ever. All right, that does it for us. Enjoy the game. We'll be back tomorrow. Run it back, yeah. Run it all. Run it back, yeah, yeah. Run it all. Run it back. Run it all. Run it back. Run it all.